Um, so as uh, Dr. Smith Khan mentioned, um, I treat uh, one of my specialties is primary sinus lymphoma. So today I'll be talking primarily about that. I want to give a quick overview of the disease itself, just so that we're all on the same page. And then um, spend the majority of the time talking about treatment paradigms, how we arrived at them. And then of course, looking at the advances that have happened in primary sinus lymphoma. We all know, but uh, just to recap, so primary sinus lymphoma is a rare but aggressive form of extranodal non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. The definition really, um, really is uh, strict in the regards to the lymphoma involving only the central nervous system, so no systemic disease, so primarily brain, spinal cord, left meningeal, and orbital involvement only. Um, in regards to the histologies, it's a diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, typically. Um, of course, you can see other types, but those are far more rare. When we look at the epidemiology of primary sinus lymphoma, you can see here over two large databases over 40 years, incidence has been relatively stable at about 0 0.4 per 100,000. And if we look at age groups, um, you can see here that this is a disease of the elderly with incidence rising with age and most notably is the most common in 70 to 79 year old patients. Clinical presentation, like anything in neurology, is based on location of lesion. Primary sinus lymphoma has a predilection to the paraventricular region, and as a result, most patients will present with some sort of cognitive complaints, typically. Um, as far as the workup is concerned, it's very important to um, extensively evaluate the uh, CNS compartments, in particular the brain, uh, parenchyma, spinal cord itself, and then of course the cerebral spinal fluid in the, um, the space, particularly via LP, and then of course the orbits with ophthalmologic evaluation. Um, the importance of this is to understand which compartments are involved with primary sinus lymphoma, as this will be prudent to um, reevaluate following administration of induction therapy to assess for responses in each of the compartments. In addition to that, a systemic involvement should be uh, in the extent of systemic involvement should be evaluated with PET CT, again, to rule out any evidence of systemic lymphoma, and then potentially consider a bone marrow biopsy as well. If we look at um, how we actually obtain the tissue, most commonly we obtain tissue um, via surgical biopsy uh, through parenchymal um, biopsy on the brain MRI, or sorry, in the brain. Um, in general, uh, it's advocated to avoid steroids for obvious concern and uh, for the biopsy to be non-diagnostic potentially due to the potential therapeutic benefit of steroids, although not sustained. Um, there's no clear indication for surgical resection in primary CNS lymphoma, partly driven by trying to reduce risk to patients, but also because this disease is very chemo-responsive. Um, not really a clear indication as far as survival benefit in this patient population. If a uh, one, if there's not a parenchymal lesion um, or you have suspicion, but the lesion is in a difficult area, there are other ways to clinch the diagnosis. One would be in patients with leptomeningeal involvement, you could obtain a cerebral spinal fluid evaluation, looking for cytology and then flow cytometry uh, with the finding of a monoclonal B cell population. Again, if you have evidence of ocular involvement, a vitro biopsy can also be performed where flow and cytometry or cyto cytology can also be performed to obtain the diagnosis. So what do we see on imaging? Usually uh, primary sinus lymphoma is a homogeneously enhancing lesion. Um, as I mentioned, um, it's typically periventricular. It could be multifocal and often is. Um, in addition to that, a uh, heralding uh, finding is typically um, pretty striking diffusion, restrict and re diffusion restriction of the lesion itself. Um, and um, if we were to complete a PET CT, these uh, lymphoma lesions are very avid with typically an SUV above 15. So on occasion, I will use a PET uh, to help me distinguish between um, true persistent disease or potentially surgical post-treatment effects that can be seen on MRI after therapy. This is a patient of mine, um, just want to display ocular lymphoma in the appearance 
you can see here the ocular lymphoma. Um, in regards to prognostication in primary sinus lymphoma, there are primarily two scoring systems that are used. I'll talk about one that's very easy to apply, and that's the Memorial Sloan Kettering prognostication system. You can see here it's um, divided into or based upon age greater than or sorry, greater than 50 or KPS uh, greater than sorry, less than 70. So in this study um, by Sloan Kettering, uh, they did RP, RPA partitioning. And uh, we're able to define three classes that were clearly, as you can see in the Kaplan-Meier, statistically different in regards to overall survival. So you can see just comparing those patients that are young um, have a median overall survival about 8.5 years, whereas the class three patients who are older than 50 and a KPS less than 70 have only a median survival of 1.1. This uh, RPA classification system is commonly applied in clinical trials to help distinguish patient populations. We'll now move on to treatment paradigms and spend the majority of the presentation discussing treatments in primary sinus lymphoma. So just to have historical background, Holbein radiation therapy was commonly used as a treatment modality. One in particular, it is responsive um, and, and produces responses of uh, survivals of somewhere around 11 to 12 months. Um, shortly later, methotrexate was introduced in the 1990s in combination with whole brain radiation therapy with superior outcomes. And really this establishes, um, the idea that primary sinus lymphoma is a chemosensitive, uh, cancer and, um, really sets the stage for the development of primary sinus lymphoma being treated primarily with chemo only. This is a phase two trial done from the Italian group. And in this study, they compared high-dose methotrexate versus high-dose methotrexate and high-dose cytarabine. And what you can see here in the overall response rates and three-year overall survival is outcomes were better in the arm that received polychemotherapy and provides the rationale for the um, application of polychemotherapy in the treatment of primary sinus lymphoma. This is a theme that I'll outline a little bit later as we look at the current regimens being used in the US. Um, this clinical trial is the only phase three conducted in primary sinus lymphoma. It's from the German group. Um, in this study, they looked at patients um, and treated them with high-dose methotrexate or high-dose methotrexate with whole brain radiation therapy. And the most striking finding is there's no difference in overall survival between these two groups. Um, and interestingly, neurotoxicity was more common in those patients who received whole brain radiation therapy. Following this, um, you can see here, um, this study was conducted at a Sloan and it was um, a retrospective study reviewing and trying to understand neurotoxicity in primary sinus lymphoma. What they were able to do is describe the phenotype of these patients. So clinically, they're stereotypic and progressive dementia. Radiographically, they have uh, progressive white matter changes. And most importantly, the risk factor was found to be radiation therapy. So along with this study from Sloan, as well as the phase three, um, it really um, established that radiation therapy one uh, is very toxic or can be very toxic and has led really the transition moving away from radiation therapy as a primary treatment modality in newly diagnosed primary sinus lymphoma. Now we'll go back to the treatment paradigm. So in general, patients are treated with an induction chemotherapy uh, consisting of, as I mentioned prior, based on the literature, a polychemotherapy regimen with methotrexate as the backbone. The most common um, treatment strategies or inductions are going to be the MTR, which is rituximab methotrexate temidar, and then RMVP, rituximab methotrexate vincristine procarb. These are probably the most commonly used in uh, the US, so I'll kind of focus on those two. In regards to their efficate, efficacy, um, in general, these two have fairly similar um, outcomes with two year overall survival somewhere between in the 60, 70% uh, range. Um, so are very comparable um, and it, which is why you see the uh, diversity of the uh, inductions being used 
More importantly, there's been no clear head-to-head -head comparing these induction therapies, making it challenging to have a clear standard of care. Following induction therapy, these patients are assessed in each of those CNS compartments that I mentioned to look for a response with a goal, of course, of, of, of obtaining a complete response. If that, is a, that goal is achieved, uh, patients will proceed with consolidation therapy. I listed three here, but primarily um, what's most commonly used is high-dose chemotherapy that's non-myeloblative or myeloblative chemotherapy followed by autologous stem cell rescue or transplant, which we'll talk about when we get to advances in the field. So in regards to the high-dose chemotherapy that's used, um, each of the inductions actually has a, a paired, so to speak, consolidation regimen. So rituximab, methotrexate, temidar is typically followed with uh, EA as the uh, consolidation regimen. And then RMVP is typically followed with high-dose cytarabine as the consolidation regimen. Now moving on to advances in primary sinus lymphoma. First, we'll talk about the utilization of autologous stem cell transplant and rescue. So as we look at this, there are numerous trials I could, I shouldn't say numerous, there are a few trials that I could discuss and bring up, but I wanted to highlight this one, one of the earlier ones. It's a phase two study of 33 patients. These patients received induction therapy with RMVP then subsequently you receive conditioning with IOTEP, Abusulf, and cyclophosphamide. The key thing here is understanding that the TBC is actually the therapeutic um, regimen in this treatment. Um, subsequent to this, patients receive an autologous stem cell transplant, or as I refer to it, a rescue um, in the hopes of them surviving this myeloblative chemotherapy. You can see here impressive response rates of 97%, very high to your overall survivals of 81%. Challenging though, is that there were, was an 11% uh, death rate among the patients who participated in the study, um, which does raise some concerns about the safety of this, um, outtake of this treatment. If we look at the data in a little bit more detail, you can see here that uh, the patients are most commonly less than 60, actually all of them, and a significant of them are less than 50. If you recall, when I was reviewing the epidemiology and primary cyst lymphoma, the majority of patients are older, particularly over 70. So this really raises the question on the generalizability of this, um, the generalizability and application of this treatment modality. Um, so this group, what they really did is explore specifically the toxicities related to autologous stem cell transplant or rescue in primary sinus lymphoma patients. Mortality rates typically in autologous stem cell transplant are less than 5%. Um, this study explored a few cases of this, and what they found was a 7% treatment mortality rate, which is obviously high and higher than those seen in non-Hodgkin's lymphomas. What's really striking is what you can see here is there's a high rate of febrile neutropenia and oral and GI mucositis. These patients commonly complain of and suffer from um, the need for parental nutrition in addition to a PCA to control the pain associated with their mucositis. And as you can see here, the median number of clinically significant AEs is five per patient, obviously very high. Really the key take home about autologous stem cell transplant, it's really starting to become standard of care. A large number of institutions um, that are seeing patients with primary sinus lymphoma um, will be recommending patients undergo consolidation with autologous stem cell rescue or transplant uh, due to these high responses, but in addition, long-term survival. Now we'll take a look at um, the application of targeted therapies in um, primary sinus lymphoma. Before we get there, a key thing we need to understand is molecular genetics uh, are starting to be explored in primary sinus lymphoma. And some discoveries have been made in the sense the understanding, specifically the BCR signaling axis, playing an important role as a driver in the pathogenesis of primary sinus lymphoma. As you've heard from prior present presenters, um, this has been a big move in the field of neuro-oncology, probably most profound in gliomas, um, but primary sinus lymphoma is trying to make headway as well 
the understanding of mutations such as MITE88, CD79B, and CAR11 being common in this disease process. Of course, with the understanding of these molecular genetics raises the application or the ability to apply targeted therapies to this disease process, which we'll get into in a little bit. And then in addition, there's also been finding of copy number gains in chromosome nine, as well as increased expressions of PDL1 and two ligands, raising the possibility of immunotherapy playing a role in primary sinus lymphoma. If we look specifically at targeted therapies, this is actually the BCR signaling access. Um, and as you can see here, key alterations seen are those in asterisks on the um, pathway. The first uh, agent that we'll look at is a brutin, which is a brutin's tyrosine kinase inhibitor, obviously attacking the brutin's tyrosine kinase itself along the BCR pathway. This was first studied in 2017 in the phase one with 20 patients with relapsing remitting primary sinus lymphoma and secondary sinus lymphoma. They were treated with single agent and brutinib. And what's impressive about this study is you can see here very fast responses. So the image that I've outlined here is an eight week period of time where you see a near complete response in that patient that's highlighted. Um, in addition, a 77% clinical response, which is impressive in relapse and remitting disease a median PFS of 4.6 and an overall survival of 15 months. These numbers are not great, but in the literature for relapse and remitting primary sinus lymphoma, these numbers are actually quite good and better than what has been shown prior. In particular, what was notable, as I mentioned, secondary sinus lymphoma was also included in this uh, population of patients. Um, interestingly, this is the first drug where primary sinus lymphoma has had greater response than secondary sinus lymphoma patients. So very interesting. Um, moving on, the, we'll talk a little bit about lenalidomide now. It is an immunomodulatory MI drug and um, acts at the NF kappa beta. And so has also been utilized as a potential therapeutic agent in primary sinus lymphoma. The phase one study was conducted and published in 2018 uh, in 14 patients with a relaxed, relapsed refractory primary sinus lymphoma and secondary sinus lymphoma. And what you see here is very similar to the abrutinib paper with good response rates greater than 50%. Of note in this study, they did have a significant percentage of responders um, who maintained that response for greater than nine months. Now, where has the uh, science led us with these two applications? Well, uh, most importantly, both abrutinib and lenalidomide with these publications have now been incorporated into the NCC and guidelines and are now um, standard of care or treatment options for relapsing or remitting primary sinus lymphoma. In addition to that, abrutinib is currently being studied uh, in multiple applications, one with the Sloan Kettering group the application of abrutinib in combination with tuximab and methotrexate, so polychemotherapy-based regimen in relapsing remitting disease. And then in addition, lenalidomide has also been explored in a polychemotherapy regimen referred to as Reverie with rituximab combined with lenalidomide. Um, both of those obviously need more information and more clinical trials to evaluate their true efficacy. Now we'll move on to immunotherapy. To be honest, immunotherapy and primary lymphoma is lacking at this time. Novolumab has probably been the most utilized in this disease. The most notable study is only a case report published in blood, uh, noting four patients with primary CNS lymphoma who had clinical and radiographic responses. Um, so a lot to be desired in this front. Lastly, what we'll talk about is the role of rituximab. So the Hoven 105 clinical trial was recently um, had its first release of data. It was a phase three randomized trial uh, from three countries, including 200 patients that were newly diagnosed primary sinus lymphoma. Therapeutic regimens included their induction therapy of MPVP, and then a group received that regimen, and another group received the addition of rituximab to that regimen. And really the findings show that there's no difference in response rates or PFS. Um, unfortunately, it's not enough time to understand the impacts of this on median overall survival 
But what this trial really has shown or challenged is their role of rituximab in primary CNS lymphoma. However, maturity of the data is needed in order to give definitive, definitive information and more importantly, clinical application of these findings. So big take homes today on primary CNS lymphoma really is defined by the lack of systemic involvement. It's prudent to evaluate for systemic involvement as well as the extent of CNS involvement at the time of diagnosis. The treatment paradigm is defined by induction therapy, which is a poly polychemotherapy regimen, including methotrexate. Consolidation, um, various options, but autologous stem cell rescue is um, at the forefront of interest at this time. Uh, this treatment is, sorry, our treatments for primary cell are very efficacious at this time. However, there's high probability of recurrence, including long late-term recurrences, including those beyond five years. And then as I've highlighted today, targeted therapies are playing a significant role in the recurrence of primary CNS lymphoma. Thank you guys for your time today. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Dr. Mendez. Awesome uh, overview of CNS lymphoma. Uh, one question I have, and I, I think a lot of others do too, is, is the diagnostic algorithm currently that's appropriate, especially given some of the molecular rearrangements that are now understood. Um, personally, I don't really see any reason in doing an LP or doing uh, vitriol sampling if tissue can uh, be safely obtained. And I, I think the bigger question is, is steroid treatment up front really contraindicated if you're going to get them in the OR within 24, 48 hours? Because even if you start to have some uh, tumor apoptosis, you're going to be able to make the molecular diagnosis quite often. Yeah, I think the challenge currently right now is molecular diagnostics has not been integrated into the diagnosis. So for example, the 2021 WHO does not really outline those molecular changes as diagnostic entities themselves. There's definitely been a push to incorporate things specifically like MITE88 being a part of that algorithm as far as the uh, molecular diagnosis is concerned. So um, there are institutions that are using things such as, um, for example, an LP in assessing cerebral spinal fluid for MITE88 mutations or um, done in ophthalmology where they take the vitreal biopsy and evaluate for MITE88 mutations to be supportive of the diagnosis. Um, in regards to the question about steroids and timing, I think it's a challenging question. I think we all who treat primary sinus lymphoma can give accounts to where patients have received steroids and um, a non-diagnostic biopsy is obtained. However, I do agree with you. I think that if there's a short time interval between initiation of steroids and biopsy, particularly if the mass is a relatively good size, I think the yield is usually very good. Um, however, it's always challenging uh, to know if you're going to take some of the operating room and of course, end up without your answer.